No my Heidi Mai, you're on Community Radio or FM, and this is Rattling the Chains, where we're going deep inside Dunedin's mayoral race. And this week our cup runneth over. When nominations closed on Friday, there were 14 contenders, so it's quite a big field now. Now over the next five weeks, we're going to try and get them all in to find out who they are and why they want to be the mayor of the Edinburgh of the South. I'm your host, Ian Telfer, and with me today are our first two contenders. So across to the left is businesswoman and former journalist Carmen Houlihan. Welcome, Carmen. Welcome. And uh, next to her is a city councillor who has made his name as a chocolate factory boss, Jim O'Malley. Kia ora, Jim. Kia ora, Ian. Jim, um, you did make your name with this chocolate factory campaign, but um, I saw in the paper it wasn't going so well. What's going on? Oh, it's really just going through um, the phases that can happen when you try to up your production from basically what we're about 90 kilos a week to about 700 kilos a week now. So um, it was a matter of getting everything up and going. Um, We are actually through that phase now, so we'll be having the AGM at the end of September and I'll be telling the shareholders sort of the journey of where we Is it just sort of birthing pangs or is it something... It was in the model. The reality of it was that we took longer to get into our building. Um, We were originally going in on the waterfront and then we didn't get in there. Um, Actually, it was a consequence of the waterfront development, ironically. Um, So we ended up getting in about five months later than we wanted to, so we ended up carrying that burn that you have for five months longer than we expected, so... Okay, so you are in there now, everything's moving, but you've got a big factory you have to fill. Exactly, and um, so we're now about, I went in there basically the last couple of months, I've gone in there as the acting general manager, um, and also to control the um, amount of money we're spending, I'm going in there, not getting paid at the moment, Um, and we're just rebuilding the team now, so we just hired our um, sales manager the other day. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so when that happened though, a lot of people saw your big idea of, a, of taking over from Cadbury and the, the contract and everything and thought, this is the guy that you know is gonna be mayor next. That's what a lot of people said on the street. Mm-hmm. Is it been a bit rockier than you expected? Oh no, I think I think you have to understand that with two million, you don't get to replace a, a sixty million dollar factory. So, so reality, it is, I think the best analogy is like a tree falling over in the forest. When it when a great canopy tree falls over, you can't put another canopy tree in its place. You got to put the seed in the ground, and the seed has to grow, and that's effectively what we're doing. So, we are. Um, the, 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 this phase now was making the company stable, which is just about through, and then it'll go into its growth phase. And I'd say judge the success of this in 10 years and 15 years' time. We have to wait that long, do we? Well, you know, I'm sure that when Mr. Hudson started, he didn't have 300 employees on his first day. True. You're still thinking big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Carmen, you were out of the blocks pretty early. In fact, I think you were probably one of the first to declare. Um, have you been getting ready for this for a while? Well, I I ran last time, and the day I knew I didn't get on, it was the day I decided, right, campaign starts again. So I've been building up, uh, talking to people, listening to what's happening, um, and making myself a, as good a candidate as I can. And that's why I decided. I, and also, of course, when Dave Carl stood down, I thought, well, it's another opportunity to run and put myself forward for mayor and for council. And I know it is, some people might say, oh, it's a little bit cheeky of someone to do that when they haven't been on council before. Um, but for me, I have worked as a journalist. I've covered about a million community board meetings. I've covered uh, full council meetings and um, RMA hearings, environment court, you know, you name it. If you go in, oh, could you cover this? Could you cover that? So I know how council runs and I'm very aware of a lot of the issues. I've been going to quite a few of the council meetings, you know, in the build up to it. And yes, absolutely, and I knew I wanted to do it. It's something I've wanted to do for years, but because of certain professional, um, maybe conflict of interest, and the time wasn't completely right and now it is so I'm delighted and I think you know there's that whole thing that Phil Kerr talks about the CEO at Otago Polytech about how if you fail you know that for me okay it was a failure I didn't get on last time and I didn't get that many votes but what I did get was I learned so much from that experience and it's made me stronger and I know exactly what I want to do now and I just hope that I can get on and advocate for our city. So how does the mayor councillor thing work? You're sort of having a bob each way? 
It seems to be quite common now that you, you want to be a councillor, but you stand for mayor as well to get the profile up. Well, I'm running for mayor and for council for several reasons. Um, Jim did it as well last time. He was an on-council and, and ran, so did Rachel Alder, so did Conrad Steadman, and they all got on council. But I'm also running, I'm taking it very seriously. I don't think it's something you can muck around with. Um, I I actually do think I've got the skills to be mayor, even though, of course, I haven't, you know, haven't been on council. As I said, I have a lot of that background, knowing council. I also am a member of the Institute of Directors. So the, the role of a mayor is a governance role. It's like you're the board chair. Mm. And in that role, um, you sit there and work out, hopefully, you know, if I was privileged enough to become mayor, obviously it would be a big learning curve, but I would be up to that challenge and enjoy it. Do you even want to be mayor, though? Or do you really want to get on council? And I ask this because there <coughs> seems to be... Uh, we've got 14 candidates. I mean, it's hard for the public to choose, and it feels a bit like it's full of people who actually want to be on council. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Um, look, I would, I would love to be mayor, um, but um, I also, you know, if that doesn't happen, I definitely want to be on council. So you're serious so. about the mayor thing? It's I'm not serious. Just an I'm extra taking box. the campaign really seriously. So I think that's you've got to take it seriously if you put your name forward. And and I think I've got the skills. If you look, I mean, I've got a master's in entrepreneurial business. I've worked in business. I've managed budgets. I've managed staff. Um, and and I'm taking as far as you know, I think you have to you have to take it seriously, and that's what I'm doing. I don't think we should muck people around. All right. All right. Hey, um, I want to do a little pop quiz now. I'm calling this rattling the chains, um, and the idea is I've got two minutes. I'm going to ask as many questions as we can get through. If you can just do the shortest, shortest answers that you can, okay? But I'm going to throw to both of you, and uh, we'll see how we go. I've got two minutes on my timer here. Very expensive one dollar timer, and uh, time goes now. Um, can you give me your full names, Carmen? Carmen Veronica Houlihan. James Paul O'Malley. Mother's full name. Catherine Bernadette Wilson. Mary Warren. Mm. Birthplace. Dunedin. Reefton. Reefton. Okay. Mm. Uh, how many people in your family? In my three. I got three daughters. That's how you count it, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, your first word that you ever spoke. I have no idea. <laughs> Your mother doesn't tell you? <laughs> Same, I don't know. <laughs> I thought mine was like block or car or something weird. Was um, it? Were you a Lego know. maniac? Maybe, that's right. Um, what did you study? Uh, I've you studied, studied journalism. I've studied advanced fiction writing. I've studied business entrepreneurship. Um, I like studying. Beauty um, therapy? <laughs> uh, physiology was my PhD, but I specialised in neuroscience in the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. you got about four or five there, Carmen. <laughs> Excellent. Um, main occupations? Journalist, uh, marketing, communications person, editor. I'm editing a magazine at the moment. Um, Jim? Jim? Scientist. Yeah. Still, mm. I still put scientist on my tax return. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Entrepreneur. <laughs> Fill in chocolate man. Okay. Um, worst job you ever had? Jim? Oh, yeah. Labour on a dairy farm on the West Coast. I was his first ever farm labourer, so he didn't understand what normal output looked like. <laughs> <laughs> Whipped you every evening. Well, he was very unhappy with me until his father told him actually he got a good labourer, and then he was happy with me. <laughs> uh, well, probably mine. Um, I'm trying to think what it was. Probably um, I worked in a actually in a, a uh, in a beauty salon in St Helier's as a, a beauty therapist at a room off the hairdressing salon, and the people who owned it were awful. The one good thing about it was I got a $75 tip from a merchant banker. <laughs> so that was a good thing about it. That's the thing that sticks in your mind, <laughs> yeah. the optimist. Um, all right, last question, three words to describe yourself. Oh, there's time, but tell me anyway. Entrepreneurial, enthusiastic, and loyal. Oh, experience, balanced, and fear. Yeah. Fantastic, there you go, awesome. All right. Um, let's talk about what this election is about, or at least what it should be about. What do you think the big issues are? Do you want to start, Jim? What do you think the big issues are uh, right now facing Dunedin and facing the next mayor? Um, I think it's more opportunities as much as issues, and that is that Dunedin has been static and quite stagnant for many years, and now we're in a medium growth um, rate of growth as a city. That's going to bring challenges, um, especially around you know, I sit on um, the Regional Transport Committee and I see where our transport's going. We're going to have wicked trouble if we don't improve public transport in the future. So we've got whole things around livability where transport sits in. Um, and they're just growth things. They're growth things in that regard. 
Um, and then we have on the other side of that coin, with all those people coming in, we're already seeing a shortage of housing. Um, and that's going to have two effects. One is the price of housing for those who can afford it. It's going to go up unless we get more housing out there. For those who are on the edge of affordability, homelessness will start to go up and we're going to have to make sure that that doesn't happen either. And then on the back of all of this, obviously, is climate change. Mm. Mm. Okay, some big stuff there. Come and agree or disagree? Oh, I agree with a lot of what Jim said, but um, for me, infrastructure is massive. I mean, I think our city, Jim's right, we've got a housing shortage in the next 10 years, I think something like more than 4,000 sections or houses short, um, the MB figures were saying that were going to be. That's a lot, and it could be, I actually think it'll probably be more. What's happening at the moment is that people are wanting to develop and build, you know, larger developments or even a house. And there's certain areas in our city, like um, Kaikarai Valley, and around Mosgill that they're getting and, and other areas as well where the infrastructure is either at capacity or getting to capacity or old you know and I mean for me the infrastructure problem is a major and it's really urgent and I do think it's it's not a problem that's just happened overnight either like it's been going on for a long time and I think certainly first term councillors are getting their feet under the desk they're getting to know the job but second and third and fourth term councillors we need to ask them what is you know why have they let the infrastructure get so bad I mean I assume <clears throat> to be fair to them it's probably money you know that we haven't had a lot of money to repair those maybe um, but I, I just think before anything else for me priority has to be the fixing the infrastructure because we can't develop our city like for example some people have had ideas about social housing my question to those people is well how are you going to move forward with that when that isn't the appropriate infrastructure for it. And what sort Jim, of infrastructure are you thinking of here? Are you thinking about roads or are you thinking about the oh, not right, sewage well, pipes or more well, developments? Yeah, or what yeah are more things like sewage pipes, like your stuff that comes to your door, you know, your stormwater, your sewage, right. your... Um, the things you want to put in place for yes, what so the city can expand. Yeah, your reticulation, your um, okay. fresh water, all those things that get piped through the house. Right. You you haven't, we haven't got the capacity in some areas for that. Mm. Jim's wanting Jim, to speak. No, let's, let's let Jim have a shot. <laughs> Well, I am. So that's called the three waters. Um, it is actually in the long term plan now. We have a massive, we've massively increased our spending on three waters. Um, and in terms of the Kaikoura Valley um, um, capacity work, that's that's under the, well, that's called the KV1, KV2 and KV3 schemes. Yeah. They're already underway. Right. Um, and this is to move water from Kaikoura Valley, um, well, to improve the water there? So that, that one is mostly around the sewer and that's to right. move the sewer requirements right. out of going over to um, Tainui and going out to Green Island yeah, instead, yeah, yeah. and that will get the sewer pipes out of the of the Cavisham Tunnel. Right. Um, I would I would argue that 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 we are pretty much that that maybe in the 90s and the early 2000s we did fall way behind as a city, but then the city is turning around. It's most of its increased spending now is right around that very point. So. I kind of take issue with saying the council has got to get their act together because oh. because we did actually redress it in the long term plan. I also think that people really do need to understand that staff do a lot of this, and it comes to us to comment on. And what I would really say is that if you're wanting for functional government, you've got to make sure that you're influencing staff thinking long before it comes to you as a paper. Yeah. Could I? Say, but what are you seeing, I, Carmen? That, that makes you think that they're not doing the job. Well, I've been told it's for Kaikoura Valley, for example, that it's going to be five years before people can get approval for, um, you know, larger developments and development in that area. Is that? Are you saying that's incorrect, Jim? No, that is correct. It's right. a, but it's. Yeah. Uh, I'll get the number slightly wrong, but I think it's about a $40 million spend in Kaikoura Valley. Right. Um, so and, it's infrastructure, and it's you're saying, the common this infrastructure is holding the city's expansion back? Yes, I am, absolutely. And, and the other, the other well, issue... I, I agree, except yeah. I'd also say that, the, the, that it's already in the spending plan on, on how to resolve You're going that. as fast as you can go. Yeah, the only, I mean, the, other, the only one thing I would say is that the stuff that was put in at the top of Kaikoura Valley um, at the start of this program, which is before I was on council, mm -hmm. I did sit on the consent of around intensification work so I've, I've got an RMA um, hmm. I can do RMA um, consents hmm. um, and we didn't grant it because we didn't have sufficient sewer capacity there's a section there that faces back into Kaikoura Valley um, that would would be, have its back up on Highgate of the hill there um, to the north of Stewart Street um, that can't be intensified because it doesn't have the sewer support does that but, back up what Carmen's saying 
or not? And, well, that stuff went into the ground about six years ago, so we're not digging that up again. Right. Um, the rest of the capacity further down the valley is to take more, is to, is to take what's described in the district plan. Mm -hmm. So the issue really is, again, when the district plan's coming out for consultation, were people consulting at the time? I have a tendency to say, think that what people do is they forget that these really important documents are coming in front of them, like the district plan, like the long-term plan. Nobody consults, and then yeah. Could it I say something on that with Come the plan? My understanding is with the because when we started, like Jim mentioned it before, that now we're medium density. When we started the plan, we were low density mm. and categorised, you know, as a reasonably right, right. lower population. What that has implications on the two GP because when they've written it, they've initially written it for the smaller population. Now I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but that they um, now there's quite an urgency for us to have suitable land um, for residential so that's not just the infrastructure as well as the land as well that's and so they will be my priorities and I'm really concerned what would you do though I mean obviously everyone's acknowledging there's a there's a housing squeeze on in yeah. Dunedin I mean it's not yeah. just in Dunedin either right but we have we're feeling it now mm -hmm. what would you do as mayor what would I do as far as, well, I prior, prioritise it. I mean, we've got to fix the infrastructure. I know that Jim's saying, and it's correct, there is some work being done, but I've talked to people who are trying to get development approved and they're being told in several areas now, no, you can't get it done. We can't see that being done in the budget for another five years. And I think Jim confirmed that actually just before. So, you know, we can wait, but of course, the longer we wait, that's a long time for a city that's got a looming you know housing crisis so the other idea I just want to say as well that I would love to look at getting done is something people everybody's saying to me when they go into council and they're doing building a house for example you have to go in and then you deal with one person then you they say oh no that's not quite right you go away then you have to go back to another mm -hmm. department and another department now the could classic we, being pushed along kind of thing yes mm -hmm. could we have what I'd love to see is that you get a case manager and so you have one person that's your point of contact, and that person deals with all the other departments. And it's an attitude. It's been talked of about, like, hasn't it? There was yeah, a, I mean, rolling I've, the red carpet. I've been talking about it, Project, absolutely. Wasn't there? And they did have yes. a re red carpet. But it was thing mainly for certain businesses. For, I think, it was wasn't? for the big developers. You want it for everyday people? Yes, I do. Because when you're running a house, you know, building a house, mm. you've got to go back and forward. I mean, why should it be red carpet? And also, I'm not 100% sure whether they're actually, and I've put an inquiry into council because I've spoken to some developers who've questioned whether that red carpet service is still happening for them as well, and right, I haven't had an answer from Jim, that. Jim so Brisbane? Jim, is that still happening? Well, last person that I knew doing that was Mike Harrison, who now is up at Waitaki District Council. So my so guess no. is that's probably not running. No, that's um, what I thought too, yeah. Um, I think I think what people think though is that we're going to go in there and have managerial activities, that we can go in and say, do that. And the reality is that, that we are under the Local Bodies Act, much less powerful than people think we are. And so I agree completely with Carmen saying. Um, I think that for three years, almost everybody on the council has said they would like that to happen, and it hasn't. So there is an important thing have with the mayoralty. That, that's the thing, that, have they pushed for that? Is you know, that the I mayor haven't relates heard it come with, up. Yeah. The mayor relates with the chief executive, and one of the main roles of the mayor is to actually make sure that the chief executive is performing their function correctly. Um, and in fact, the healthy um, local government is based on a healthy relationship between the mayor and the chief executive. So when you see something not happening down there in the building department or in the economic development unit, you're not legally allowed to go down there and belt heads together, but you are legally allowed to go over and tell the chief executive that come their next performance review, mm. you're going to be looking at that stuff and saying whether you want to keep them on or not or whether you're going to pay them or not. That's kind of like the stick part of it. The carrot part of it is you, you, you share your vision with the staff and hopefully bring the staff along. Mm. Um, oh, I certainly don't want to, you know, yeah. be sounding like I'm reprimanding the CEO and saying, look here, yeah. do this and that. But however, I think an election is a great time to voice these issues because people again and again are saying it. It's not just one person and Jim's confirmed that there's been concern about it as well. I personally haven't seen it advocated for a lot from council, but... Um, I know it is a major issue for a lot of people and it would make things a lot easier. I'd love to see council, and council to a degree has that, but at the moment the perception is it's very inflexible right. and I'd love to see it saying how can we help. Very good. All right, it's 5.20 and you're on Otago Access Radio and uh, I'm Ian Telfer and this is Rattling the Chains.
And my guests today are mayoral contenders uh, Carmen Houlihan and Jim O'Malley. Um, let's change tack slightly. Carmen, you put up a proposal to train people in and out of Dunedin. Were you serious, Port Chalmers and Mosgill? Oh, train. Well, actually, Jim said it as well, as a yeah. matter of fact. Well, I have been speaking now. to... Um, we're not a big enough city for this, <laughs> are we? Actually, it's funny you say that. I've just come from today. I've been speaking at a rest home in Mosgill, and the people were saying, oh, my goodness, could we get trains going in and out? They said, we used to have it. We would love it. Um, the problem is with it is that it would cost a fortune to do, because at the moment, the tracks are at capacity, yeah. and... Um, um, what ki- the people I've spoken to at Kiwi, Kiwi Rail are saying is that, um, yeah, there's, there's an issue with they're at capacity almost themselves, and so they need to spend more money to build a new track for them to do more. So maybe I'm not going to give up on it though, because I, I think too how many hard cars? For now. It's too hard, perhaps for now, because it's going to cost a lot of money. It's a big project, but I would love to see it happen. It'd be great. I mean, maybe what it could be is a shared funding model where Kiwi Rail, the council, and government perhaps step forward for funding, because it does take a lot of sustain but um, you know tax for the the government as well who are keen to see lower vehicle use and that type of thing <coughs> but in reality uh, Wellington and Auckland have been able to sustain trains because mm. if they've got three or four hundred thousand people a million people right but Dunedin's got a hundred thousand are we ever going to have a suburban train system Jim well I mean I I was on the front page of the ODT bringing this up about four months ago mm-hmm. um, and I am the city's representative on the Regional Transport Committee mm-hmm. so this has been raised with Kiwi Rail and with NZTA and I, we're actually heading towards trying to get on what's called the transitional rail spend which means that if you look at the government policy statement on transport Is this came part out, of the billion dollar fund that no, 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 so it's quite a different, different. fund set. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem right now is Kiwi Rail has to pay for its own rail bed and it's still not known from the government whether or not it's going to become a crown entity or have to stay what it is. Also, the extent to which um, NZTA pays towards the rail maintenance and, and moving freight off-road onto rail so is this all still tied a little up bit tied up. how government funds it? Right, so I have, um, after, what I, after that announcement I made, um, I did meet with Kiwi Rail along with the head of our infrastructure here at the DCC and the CEO of Dunedin Rail to talk mm-hmm. about the structure of what a commuter rail run out of Mosgill would look like, a, a trial run. So that as Carmen points out, there's a section um, near the old Burnside Freezing Works which is completely wrecked and the trains have to go down to like 20 kilometres an hour. Because of the fire? Or no, the no, no, it's just been, Kiwi Rail's been run into the ground yeah. and Southern mm-hmm. Rail has been most run into the ground. So my objective actually, um, as mayor is to get us back to a um, metro spend. There's only three metros in the government's eyes, Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, Mm -hmm. and Dunedin is not on that group. Mm -hmm. So we're in the provincial spend. Our problem is that we're considered too small to be a metro and too wealthy to get provincial growth fund money. So we end up getting neither. We're not as big as Hamilton or even Tauranga now. Oh, we're only a few thousand short of them. And, And the reality is, like our hospital spend, we, it's not just your population. We have one of the biggest export, export ports in the country. So you can't just look at your country's, the city's population. You look at the freight movements. So the, the Southern Freight Line is one of the busiest freight lines in the country. Mm. Um, the problem we run into with commuter rail out to Mosgill is it's only electronically signaled as far as Wingatui. So it needs some more signaling. So do you know how much it would cost? I think it was $25 million to do the track work, and then you'd have to get the trains. Which sounds but, like a big matter, but is it? I mean, well, you compare the fact that Wellington's just been given a $2 billion spend on its improvement of connectivity to the airport, to the centre of town. Mm. Now they are three times as big as us, so I wouldn't mind $700 million coming from the government if you don't mind. Population wise, I think we're just being underserved by the central government. Mm. Yeah. What do you make of transport coming? Well, I think there's a major issue with it at the moment. That's one of the reasons why I'm standing for Mayor and Council, is I'm, I have concerns about the city because I go in now and I can't get a park, I'm running around, I'm, you know, it's it's quite hectic. And I'm not the only one who's saying that, there's a lot of people saying it. And it's not just cycleways that have been put in that are taking a lot of the car parks away, but there's also, we've had a, quite a large um, percentage of population growth. So you combine that with, 
um, not having an adequate public service transport system at the moment and we've got you know we've got issues if we had a world-class public transport system it'd be great I mean I think a lot of people would think oh well I don't mind are we willing to pay for it though that's what it comes down to I know it? well you get that's what you pay for, don't you? Yeah. Well, we also under the Land the Transport moment, Management Act are not even allowed to run it I mean the law is that the regional councils must run public right. transport so you've got to get got to have a good relationship with the regional council when you've well got so we have a thing called connecting Dunedin and, yep. and I worked with Trevor Kempton on the ORC to sure. get councillors on that committee mm-hmm. and it's met like three times in the last year right. we're starting to get there starting to get there slow um, but I think you know again um, trying to get hold of the Minister of Transport to get the Land Transport Management Act changed mm-hmm. so I, there's oh. no reason Dunedin shouldn't run its own public transport all right mm-hmm. lots of issues there all right just a few minutes left um, time's ticking by but let me ask you this um, do you get a sense of what sort of what sense do you get of the mayoral field? There are 14 candidates. Um, it's a big field and it's hard for people to, I think, decide. Is there an obvious front runner or how do you, like, is it going to be an open book? What is it? Do you want to tell me, Carmen? How do you see it? Well, I mean, I think it's it's a time where people have a decision to make. Do they want the same? Do they want to vote in the same people who have been on council? Or do, or do they want something fresh and new? Mm-hmm. And that's where hopefully I hope they vote for me. It's the first time for 30 years, I'm told, that there isn't an incumbent mayor sitting. Right? Yeah. Does that make it easier or harder? Well, I think it's a good opportunity because um, Dave Cull's stepping down. He's done a long time of service. And I think now it's time for us to have some change. A lot of people are saying that now. And I do think there's sort of a bit of a win for change. Is there a mood for change? I think so. Jim? Um, well, it is, it's a much more open field when the incumbent's not running. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, I would also acknowledge that last time I ran, I ran for mayor under the heading of run for mayor, get on council, and it did work for those who ran for the mayoralty. Mm. So I think that reflects the fact that it's very hard to get coverage. Um, on the other side of that, um, you know, I'm obviously speaking for myself at this point when I'm saying that the three years I've had on the council has been very, it's been quite invaluable level of experience, and that does help. Um, a bright person in that chair, though, could do the job. I'm not saying that someone who's not a councillor couldn't. Mm. Um, um, I'm. I'm hoping that I've got a reasonably good shot at it, to be honest. Yeah. You're sort of an insider candidate in that sense. Are you an outsider candidate, Carmen, or not? Oh, definitely I'm an outsider because I'm not on council. Hmm. Does so that make it harder? Anyone who is not on council, it's going to be harder because there's name recognition and they're incumbents. Right. You know. But I think if you look at what's happening with council at the moment, a lot of those councillors, there's a lot of fighting. They spend a lot of time um, disagreeing on things. I think we need someone to come in to work with their skills and abilities and look at um, having some, you know, more friendly <laughs> discussions and getting rid of some of that, you know, the nastiness that's there because it's been going on for quite a while and people are a bit sick of it. What do you think the dynamic's been on the council? Does it need to change, Jim? Um, well, I think it's about to change. Um, those of us who got on in the last triennium were actually saying that we were kept on the outer and we were kept on the outer. I'd say that a lot of that negativity did not stem from us and a few of us are on the saving end of it. Mm. There's a classic council I'd like you to watch. Um, <laughs> I felt like I was taken down an alley and beat up by some people. Um, Carmen's completely right. Going into this next council, we have to behave in a more mature way. There's no doubt about that. Time for a woman? Someone said that to me the other day and I didn't know how to respond. Well, obviously, I'd say yes. (laughs) Is that a factor? Time for a feminist. (laughs) <laughs> time for a feminist. All right, there, there you go. go. You heard it first here. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming in, both of you. Um, plenty more we could say, but um, we've got through a fair bit. Um, thank you for being brave and being our first mm-hmm. candidates on, on Rattling the Chains, and good luck with your campaigns, both of you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to listen back, there'll be a podcast of this program on the ORFM website, oar.org.nz, and we're also videoing these. So if you want to watch a full video, um, it'll be a riveting watching, I'm sure, on ORFM Facebook page, and you can also find the YouTube channel. Um, But a surprising number of people have been tuning into this, so please join us um, in getting involved in that one. And I'm going to start the theme. Here you go. Um, next week, we have to move up a notch because we're going to have, we think, three guests uh, at, a, at a time from now on. We've got 14 candidates to get through in five weeks, so we're going to have to go a, a full way. Um, and if we do that, we'll, we'll go even longer. We'll go 45 minutes to make it fairer on the candidates. So um, you'll have more to enjoy or tear your hair out about. Okay, next Monday at five here, there'll be at least two people. There'll be sitting councillors Andrew Wiley and Aaron Hawkins. Uh, a third candidate will be confirmed if he answers his emails. Um, thank you to my long, uh, my outstanding production team, Leslie and Jeff. 
Jeff and Domi. And thank you for being with us this evening. Have an excellent evening. Kia ora mai. <laughs>